Welcome, everybody. It's time once again for the next chapter with Charlie Hedges. As he explores turning the page on his life and yours. Hey, Charlie. Hi, Paul. You know, a couple of weeks ago, in late June of 2020, I was fortunate to be a part of a Zoom gathering of more than a dozen people guided by my life coach, Dina Crowder. Dina took the time to organize this gathering of mixed races and mixed genders. The purpose? To discuss and inform, not debate, but discuss and inform on current events in an attempt to genuinely understand our differences, but even more important, to reflect on our similarities. As a woman of color, Dina has experienced so many things that are anathema to someone like me, an average white male, and still, Dina continues to respect all people and showed it in our deeply moving two-hour discussion. Dina wrote an essay, and I would like to read excerpts from her essay, and she wrote this. We are in a crisis of connection, a deep soul sickness, and the biggest threat to humanity is this crisis. And one of its main vehicles is supremacy ideology. The pure-cut, uncut kilo of supreme ideology we have all been snorting comes to us uh, even uh, causes us even to compare pain like my pain is worse than your pain so now I'm the master or whatever and uh, or I have had a privileged life so now I have to be subjugated into shame shame and guilt keep the system humming as per usual What is the antidote, Dina says, if not the magic elixir that allows us to value and respect one another and create a world that truly lines up with our values? It is the greatest advantage in the cosmos. It trumps every item on our toxic and traditional value scale, the kind of value scale that was designed to keep people like me in the back of the bus. Dino goes on to suggest there is only one value that counts, only one, and that is love. And then she she concludes by saying, if you're serious about transforming yourself in this experiment we call the American Republic, you must step into the fray with the full armor of love. Dina, that is, um, I think that's just brilliantly written. I, I, I really like that. Mm, thank you, Charlie. And yeah, thank you. And 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 I think your thoughts are so helpful in comprehending and dealing with the struggles and chaos of our current times now in July of 2020. And but before we begin the the conversation with with Dina, I'd like to make a personal statement. And I and I really do want to say, as an American white male, I have to begin this conversation with with an admission confession, if it were, there is so much about our cultural divide of racism and bigotry and white privilege that I simply do not know or I am not aware of. But I am here to learn, and I look forward to it. And I am so honored and so excited to bring on my life coach and the ever so deeply insightful Dina Crowder. Dina, welcome to the next chapter with Charlie. Thank you. It's always great to be here, Charlie. Well, you're always great on the podcast. I love having you. And so what I want to do is I, I would like to begin with a couple of weeks ago in our in our Zoom dinner with Dina. Mm-hmm. And that, you know, there were, what, you know, 15 to 18 people or something like that with 40 on the waiting list. And, and um I would I would like to talk about that event. Tell me, you know, what were your goals in the processes you were thinking about in creating this event? One of the things that I know is that power begins with connection. And in order for us to change anything, we have to connect. As you just read, Um, I see that we're in a crisis of connection, which means we're disconnected. 
we're disconnected from the source of our own inner power. We're disconnected from our divinity. We're disconnected from our neighbor. Based on any number of things, race, age, class, and the list goes on. Because of that, my first goal was to be able to put people together so that they could connect and to provide a structure where people from really disparate backgrounds and of various genders and ages could connect in a structured manner and see, oh my goodness, this, this is how we are alike and also this is what it means to really uh, respect another type of person, to be able to receive their contribution, to know that they matter, and to grasp how power and powerlessness are running as undercurrents in, a, in our society in terms of the dynamic. I think people were really able to see that, and that was also one of my goals, to uh, kind of pull back the curtain so people could feel in their body what does it feel like to be in the power position? What does it feel like to be in the powerless position? And wait a minute, if we can connect, we can intersect at the point of humanity. You know, that, that, and that was exactly what you achieved. And I want to talk about you, you had us, had us um, participate in an exercise that was extremely insightful in power and powerlessness and and I was listening to Jordan Peterson have a discussion. They didn't call it a debate, but a discussion with Sam Harris. And Jordan Peterson brought up a point that I had never really thought of before, but he says, you know, the, the history of the world really is a history of power. And it is one country, one one civilization, one group trying to have power over another group, and we just... The whole history of the world is about power conflicts, and that's what we're that's what we're dealing with today. And that we're we're trying to equalize the power rather than and have all landing on one side rather than another. And 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 we will be hinting at that all along the way. And I I think that's a that's really insightful. And and and, and something else I wanted to comment on very briefly, and that was. Your idea of connection. Not only are we disconnected with other people of different, you know, of different backgrounds and different history of experiences in ourselves, but we are disconnected with ourself. Uh, tell me, Dina, how does that, how does that being disconnected with self, how does that impact all that's going on today? Well, when I as a person, am disconnected from my core, when I'm disconnected from what I say in my TEDx talk is the deepest part of you is the deepest part of everyone else. And when the deepest part of you intersects with the deepest part of life, you're in that place of inner power. You're connected to your spirit. When you're not, guess what happens? Well, you, you may not even know you're disconnected. But you are, and you begin to suffer little by little from ever-decreasing self-worth and ever-increasing fear and the need to really become attached to a rigid identity based on this value scale that we've identified, Charlie. We're at one end of the scale. If you're aligned with certain qualities, you're considered valuable. And traditionally in our culture, it's been whiteness, maleness, heterosexuality, reason, logic, Newtonian time, force, disembodied spirit, and significant money or finances. So if you're on the other end of the scale, scale or you're perceived to be... And that's the, aligned, that's the power end of the scale. That's, yes, that's the high end of the value scale. And if you are on the other end, the, the farther away you are from this, those, those things that I just named, the more your value goes down. So way on the other polarity, we've got blackness, femaleness, 
sexual choice, creativity, intuition, holistic awareness, compassion, wisdom, soul, and insignificant finances or money. Let me, let me tell you how this, just one, one of the ways this is playing out right now in real time. Um, the current president um, of the United States, his, I think it's his niece, just wrote a book. They are fighting about whether or not this book can be allowed out into the public because apparently she says some things that Donald Trump finds disparaging about himself and his family. One of the things that she says is that Donald Trump was trained, conditioned by his father to not have empathy or compassion, that these things were viewed as incredibly weak and even repulsive. And just for the sake of conversation, maybe some of the people listening like Donald Trump, but this isn't about him and whether you like him or don't like him. This is about setting up the conversation. So let's just assume that she's telling the truth. And if if that's the case, um, then we have someone who lacks the capacity for compassion in an extremely important and powerful public position, setting policy, setting the tone, and modeling behavior. So now we go back to our scale where something like compassion and wisdom are devalued on this value scale. They're devalued. They're like not worth that much and even repulsive. Yuck. What good do they do? Ugh. But however, force. Now, that's, that's powerful, and that's valuable. And we see that in terms of the way that he and his administration navigate the world. We want tanks. We want force. We want to show our power in that way rather than compassion is seen as, um, it's just seen as not powerful, very weak. It's not seen as an effective tool, but it actually is. And it's necessary for a positive and thriving republic. Yeah, absolutely. You know, yesterday I had a meeting with my, um, a phone call with my psychiatrist, and, you know, it was our, our therapy session, and, and we got just ever so briefly on Donald Trump, and he just said, besides narcissism, that he, narcissism, that exactly, he said exactly what you said. He said he's just, he is he lacks empathy. He is no empath. He just cannot, it, it just does not register, seem to register with him. And I don't want this to be an anti-Trump show, but, y- you know, there are some difficulties there. Um, I, I, I have a question, Dina. As you, as you listened, uh, as you listed the power values and the, uh, if I may call them the power less values, mm-hmm. what does a person like me who, you know, there are certain qualities of each that that apply to me. You know, not I, I'm not totally in the power realm, and I'm not totally in the powerless realm. What about when you have aspects of each? How does how does someone like me sort of identify what are the best things I need to be looking at and evaluating in my life? Did that question make any sense? I think. So I, I believe that we are all meant to to be hybrids, and um, the issue isn't that there's something wrong with with whiteness. So we can please let's take that out of the discussion. That is that is completely um, irrelevant, ineffective, and it, it why 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 do pe- why people bring that up? I don't know. Um, the point is that on this scale we've been using, we have overvalued some things and undervalued others. So the goal is not to simply flip the dominator system and say, well, now I'm in charge, right? Now all these things that were undervalued, now they are the most valuable and white people are not valuable. That's not the point. The and then we create this, to, the same scenario in We create the same scenario, which is another supremacy ideology. And supremacy ideology, no matter whether it... Race is just one of the vehicles. No matter what it's about, it's 
ends up toxic, and it is just as toxic for the person who, or the type of person, who's perceived to be at the top of the, the top dog as it is for the underdog. And that's what we haven't connected to. We think that it's either, oh, the underdogs are just complaining and, you know, they yeah. don't really have it that bad. Or we think, oh, wow, it's so bad for the underdog. But what we are not talking about is the fact that it is just as to- toxic and just as much of a killer for the thriving of those people in the top dog situation. And we, we are not talking about it because it looks like the people in, let's say, the top dog position have control of the, the money um, or have control of public policy. So we're saying, well, it looks like they're winning. Okay, yes, they're winning in certain areas, but in others they are, to quote T- Tony Morrison, bereft. They're bereft. Define that term, and please. It, they are... <laughs> I'm going I'm to use a, a phrase that my uh, grandma used to say. They, they are being held together by two pieces of bubblegum. <laughs> God forbid somebody blows a bubble. God, and and I'll I'll give you a very quick example. Recently, there have been a spate of situations that have been caught on video, and one of them really uh, interested me because there was a male CEO. He was in a restaurant in Carmel, and he. I don't know, maybe he had one, one too many drinks or something, and he, he, what he felt about Asians really came out. He began screaming and cursing. Seriously? Oh, yeah, it's on video. It's on video. He, became, he started screaming and cursing at this Asian family, and he told them to get the F out of the country. You need to... No way. Country. No way. Oh, yeah, yeah. You effing Asian pieces of shit. This isn't your country, et cetera. <clears throat> so this is just a family, American family who happen to be Asian, they're sitting there with their kids, they, they don't know what to do, and one of the servers said, you need to leave, sir, these customers are valued, we don't speak to people like that in this establishment, and he, <clears throat> he got more irate. Turns out, he's a CEO of a tech company in the Bay Area, and how this relates to what my grandma said about Bob Gum is on the surface, he's the top dog. He's got these qualities that we associate with the high end of the value scale. So the assumption is, well, he must feel really great and confident. But yet, whatever's going on in the current environment has triggered him in such a way that he feels threatened. So threatened that he has to scream epithets at the, this family because he's so scared. And that's what we're not talking about. We're not talking about the fact that the people who often, <clears throat> you know, are seen as the top dogs um, and have a lot of resources and advantages at their disposal, if you, if you press a little bit, if you dig down just a tiny bit, they are scared to death, like this gentleman. And there are so many examples of this happening recently, Charlie. That, that was, that's interesting. That's really interesting that you brought that up, because that was my next question. My next mm-hmm. question was, you know, there are indeed certain people that are, you know, are, are just motivated by power and by control and by ego. But, but you know, I think they're the, I think they're the, the rarity. I I was going to say. I think most people. I I, I don't. I, I have to be careful of saying. I think. I don't. I wonder if most people who are in power and want to keep power. It's really more of an attribute of fear than anything mm-hmm. else. Mm-hmm. It's a fear of fear of losing what they have. Fear of of who knows what. But but but. Absolutely. That's the number one thing. I even mention it in my TEDx talk. It's the fear of loss. Fear of loss of safety, loss of 
relevance, loss of status, a loss of safety. This fear of loss is right under the surface. Because when we set up a value scale like the one we we have been operating under and within, where there's a top dog and underdog, a master, a slave, a superior or an inferior, nobody wants to be on the bottom. Nobody wants to go to the back of the bus. (laughs) It is not a comfortable place, and it is associated with humiliation. Who wants that? Ergo, if you are in a position that is perceived as safe or relevant, valuable, significant, et cetera, fill in your own blanks, and in some way things are changing, things are changing, and that means that the perception of who who you are, where you belong, your identity may also shift and change. The threat is, oh my goodness, what am I going to lose? Yeah. And it, how am I going to be humiliated? And where will I belong next? Because I don't want to wind up on this other end of the scale. It's just frightening. You, 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 you know what you know what I, I'm thinking as you're talking here, and for those that are familiar with uh, Maslow's hierarchy, mm-hmm. it's that no matter who the person, we really still have we have not as a culture advanced beyond uh, level one or two of mm-hmm. of Maslow scale. Mm-hmm. We're not we're not moving toward enlightenment or maturity. We're still at that. We're still cavemen. We're still at that. We're we're still at 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 a, at, a, at a very almost primal state, even though our intellects have increased. You know, I love that book by Alan de Button. Did did you read the the School of Life? And I didn't. Oh, it's a brilliant book. And and his his thesis. He's British, and he has several schools in England or in Europe that are called the School of Life. And he says, we are never taught about emotions. We are never taught about emotions and hierarchies and that. We are only taught, taught how to read, write, and, and, and become technically advanced. And he says, the human race today is uh, like a bunch of cavemen, or no, has the emotional maturity of cavemen and picks, and the intellectual capacity of nuclear thermal warfare. <laughs> with, that's about it. <laughs> and and you know that, that's that's you know that that goes to emotions, but that also goes to what we're talking about now, is that we we really don't we haven't advanced that part of our brain that moves us away from need and to thinking about others and caring about others. Mm-hmm. I, what I want to do now... De- yeah, our no, consciousness no, no. hasn't kept pace. I, that's the way I see it, because we're talking about connecting to inner power and connecting to really the essence of yourself, which is your spirit. And if you are not connected to that for yourself, and uh, you used the word maturing, and maturing, then you will have to live at that kind of cave person or you know this this state of survival primal fear is this is this a subject for intellectuals or is this a subject for everybody in the world i I know it will help everybody in the world but will it translate to everybody forget the world translate to everybody in the united states or is it is there a certain degree of of education and uh, that's required to even even access this kind of thinking, or is this kind of thinking accessible to anybody? It is so accessible to anybody, and I'm going to tell you how how it is accessible to anybody living in this country today. If you ask someone who says, "Oh, well, I, I don't, I don't know about 
um, black and white or racism or implicit bias or you know all the terms mm-hmm. that mm-hmm. are yeah, there's in the so many right terms now. that are coming there's so up. many terms and a lot of it is confusing people don't understand what means what so all you have to do is ask this one question which i asked my friend recently uh, you may find this uh, interesting, Charlie, but my very, very best friend throughout college was the president of the Young Republicans Club. <laughs> and we, <laughs> he, he is a tall, good-looking Aryan soccer player. This is a true story. And he belonged to a fraternity that maybe even still when we were in college had a no people of color clause. Oh, really? Oh, yeah. So, And that was... And that was in the 80s, Dina, or 90s? Oh, I'll never tell. <laughs> <laughs> it was a couple decades ago. Oh, yeah, I'll never tell. But it made for lively discussions, let us say. Many, many lively discussions. And he contacted me recently to say how disappointed he was in where we are as a country with topics of humanity and race, etc. He said, we were talking about this back in college when we were... 17 and 18, and I, he's, he's extremely successful, and he has a beautiful family, and he said, I learned more from our conversations, which sometimes got very heated, um, than I have since from anything I've read, any training I've participated in, because he said the truth is nobody connects and, and actually talks to one another. And one of the things that I asked him is, okay, if you want to explain um, the fact that people, anybody, understands what's going on with this topic, uh, regardless of whether they read anything or they're intellectual, ask them this question. Would you want to trade places or would you want any of your male children to trade places and be walking around this country in a black body? And my friend, he he has uh, he has sons. They're teenagers now. He has sons, and of course, the answer is no. So that's all we have to ask to get anybody to understand that we are operating in a very real framework where these things do matter in real time. We, oh, that's a brilliant question, because we really are operating in a very segregated mindset, and, and, that we, and, and that we just look at one particular group of people and say, no, I don't want my child to be like that. I want my child to be in... And, and, it, and it helps understand, you know, I, I'm not a big advocate of the word white supremacy, but I do like white uh, privilege. Mm-hmm. And I think, I think there's a lot of white privilege. And do I want my son to be able to experience that? Of course. You know, I'd, but, but then again, you know, that just shows, that just shows our disparity. Now, I want to transition here to back to the dinner party because... You did something at that dinner party that changed the entire demeanor of the dinner party, that really gave all of us as participants an opportunity to learn something. And and I'm talking about your exercise. Mm-hmm. Would you describe that exercise, and then we'll talk about um, the ramifications of it? Absolutely. Um, one of, One of the things that went into the exercise is in the question I just asked my friend, would you want any of your sons to be walking around in a black body? I don't think his no was so much because he doesn't like black people um, as it was about the way he perceived his sons would be treated by others. Yes, yes. And I think that's important. I think that's what you're pointing to because... No person alive wants to disadvantage their children. That's right, and that, that's that's right. It's not. It's not a. It's. It, it really, oddly enough, it is. I mean, ironically enough, it's not a prejudicial, but it's a. It's you know having your son walk around disadvantaged when he doesn't that's have right. to. Nobody wants to do it, and so that question, all it, all that question does to me is 
prove the fact that every person, no matter how well-read or not well-read they are, knows something is up in terms of this scale of basic advantage and disadvantage. And my other question that I asked another friend, and I said, here's the question for you. Would you be willing, generally speaking, to live in a society where the color of your skin, and she happens to be white, is not, also generally speaking, an advantage. And, you know, she really had to say, oh, well, okay, I never thought of it that way. That's really what we're talking about, and that's really the threat. Because nobody, it's just a human trait. Why do you want to give up an advantage? You don't. <laughs> <laughs> you, you, so, you, you know, you know, Dina, what, what you're doing, I know you didn't want to talk white and black, but you're talking about upper-middle-class white that have never, ever had those questions posed to us. Correct. Those are, those are critical questions, because I will ask, show me where I've been racist. Show me where yeah. I've been a bigot. Show me yeah. personally what I have yeah. done, because you know... That would not be a, a name that comes to your mind when you, you know, a title no, or a all. claim that, that comes to not mind when you think of not me. I mean, uh-huh. you know, for crying out loud, in 1969, I was protesting with the Black Panthers in Watts. Yeah, no, you know, I, I, uh, that's not what comes to mind with you, Charlie. <laughs> but those questions, nevertheless, Dina, I'm not off the hook because yeah. those questions really get at the heart of. Oh my goodness, you know, I, I, I do appreciate this white privilege without ever knowing, really, truly, without ever thinking about the advantage of it. Yeah. You know, it just so because it is there, you, you know, it's just not part of my mindset. Yes. It's, 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 in, it's, inner, it's an inner thing that we all know, and that leads us to the exercise. I knew that I had to do something to help people have an embodied experience. <laughs> of yes, power. it was an embodied experience. Right? And I knew it had to be very memorable. And I'm, I'm going to It had tell to be you, brutal. <laughs> <laughs> that was not the word I was looking for. But that's it what had, the word it was. <laughs> it had to be um, intense enough that it would be remembered in the body. And what I... Um, in had everyone uh, do who was willing I want to make it clear that this was not forced it, I gave people absolute uh, the absolute sovereign choice to either witness or participate but everybody chose to participate was uh, for one people were in pairs and one person kind of role played being sort of a kind of a George Floyd type of character, and the other, a law enforcement or, um, you know, type of character, and had them really go into those roles and feel and express and experience from, from each of those divergent points of view. And one of the things that someone told me, Charlie, uh, that was reporting their feedback was, who who was um, playing the in the in the in the one with the, you know the power position was playing the one of the law enforcement officers said oh my gosh I never realized that if you're in a position like this of you know where you have the the ability to use force and it's sanctioned and you're numb then the cries for mercy they irritate it. Me more. No kidding. Yes. And this woman was a black woman, and she said, I now am walking away with a level of compassion and, a, that I, and, and understanding that I never had before, because what I now understand is that if you have the sanctioned use of force, but you're using it in that way, it's actually because you feel powerless. So, so in a sense, we, we are the issue that we're wrestling with, 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 if we want to say both sides of this continuum, but that just, you know, that just, that just irritates the the whole conversation. But both both people in your in your 
in your exercise can experience powerlessness, that the power right. coming from the powerful person, the law enforcement officer, is really out of powerlessness. Mm-hmm. Now, you know, I, I, I was with, um, well, I think there were, I was with another, with another man, mm-hmm. and I did not want to be the cop, so I said, I'm going to be the victim. Uh-huh. And and it was really interesting, you know, I won't give his last name, but Daryl was his first name. And Daryl is a black man, and I made him be the cop. And he, <laughs> he, he said, you SOB, you know, and just, he, 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 didn't want, he didn't want to do that. But Dina, when I was saying, I can't breathe, take your, your foot off my neck, and, and, or your, your knee off my neck, and, and I was saying, this is, this is unfair, you you know who do you think you are? You know you can't be, you know because I still had, you know some of, some of the the white feeling of authority that I could question another authority, mm-hmm. and he came back at me. He was amazing. Mm-hmm. He came back at me and said, "Shut the f up! I don't know what you're talking about. You know I'm 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 doing my job. You freaking loser! You know you just and and I was just. Utterly, for the first time, I was really struck with this feeling of of powerless, powerlessness mm. from authority. And you know, I've I've never, you know, I've had my days with the police. Believe me, in the in the seventies, you know, you can check me out. I've had my days, and I felt powerless. But uh, this totally reminded me of that. That that the that police officers carry so much power. And so much, whatever they say is the rule, or you're going to jail. You know, you're. You, it's, it's not a. It's not a pretty time. But I, I really felt this horrible sense of powerlessness out of it, and and mm-hmm. it was a brilliant exercise. You know, because it really, like your two questions you just asked, gave me, mm-hmm. gave me reason, fodder for me to ponder what the issues really are, and to understand people who are powerless and have been subjected to a, to a powerless sort of whole way of life and lifestyle, but I could think of it very differently. We come back to humanity once again. We come back to connection once again, and we come back to love once again, because when... A lot of people engage in any aspect of this conversation. They, again, resort to polarities, which is, oh, my goodness, maybe there's racism, but it's not stopping certain people. Or maybe there's sexism, if it's not about race. Or maybe there's thisism, but it's not stopping you. And it's not an either-or. The way that I was raised, Charlie, which unfortunately appears to be unique, but I wish it wasn't, is that I was taught there are these things operating in our society. There will be people who make assumptions about you, and that's something that you will have to deal with, but it's not something that can stop you because you are powerful. And you are powerful because you have the ability to connect to this inner source of power. And that is the greatest advantage. And it's greater than any other advantage. Uh, So there's a, a both and. It's not a one or the other. It's not the, oh, my goodness, these people, whoever these people are that we're talking about, have been in the inferior kind of position in terms of the value scale or in terms of public policy or in terms of law, and so now they need our charity. No, that's making them agentless and taking away their humanity and their ability to actually be soft. Absolutely. That is so critical. Thank you for bringing that up. And so you have to have that as well as you have to have some compassion. Is that pity? No. Is that your, I'm so sorry for you, you're less than me? No. It's an actual feeling with someone because when you have compassion you realize i'm human you're human and we connect at the we intersect at this common point of humanity 
You may have more money, you may have less money. You may have more education, you may have less, etc. But guess what? We both have value as human beings. And that's the thing that I see is missing. So back to you, you're a hybrid. I'm a hybrid. We need hybrids. We need people who embody and are willing to stretch to have and inhabit aspects of not only, you know, one side of the scale, but also others. You, you, you know what we're missing, Dina? And I, I think so many people are saying this, of my friends anyway, is that what you did, what you did with that dinner party is you promoted the one thing that, I think the one thing that is going to be a major impact on our culture is when we get to have discussions and not yelling matches and mm-hmm. debates mm-hmm. and name calling because that gets us nowhere until we can have a discussion until persons from all representative points of view can express here's how I'm feeling about it it's good for you to know but then also if I'm misinterpreting you please tell me mm-hmm. so I can so I can see that that's just been my history of experience, and it's not yours, but we need dialogue. We're dying for dialogue. Yeah, and that is why I really am passionate about taking the Power Lab to people, people hosting more dinner parties. Um, I would like to teach people and to spread this model because I agree absolutely with you. Yeah, and you nothing. And, you know, nothing changes with the cancel culture. So if no. somebody does something, and like the um, I mentioned, the CEO who kind of went irate in the restaurant. There was a female CEO again in the Bay Area. I, I don't know what's with the Bay Area, but um, she her name was Lisa Alexander. She was passing by a man painting Black Lives Matter on his stoop in his on his house he had a as i understand it an expensive neighborhood she got angry and told him he couldn't do that and she called the police and the police came and the police happened to know the gentleman who was filipino and uh, kind of brown skin um and so they didn't do anything they they left but her husband and the homeowner had videoed the incident the video got out and i believe that she, um, you know, she she really had a huge business fallout from that because it, her whole perspective was she called the police because she didn't believe that he could own this home. I she remember that. I read yes. that, that she, she didn't believe that he owned the home. And, and he, told and he had owned the home for like 30 years or... And she had said, you don't live here. Yeah, I read the article, and she said, you don't, you have, I know all my neighbors, you don't live here, and you've been there 30 years. You don't own this. And the, you know, when things like that happen, and we have huge backlash, it can feel like, oh, vindication, right? She got punished because she was wrong. Okay. She, she did something that was extremely ignorant and also showed us what her implicit assumptions are. However, just only stopping at punishing people, firing people, doesn't change anything. And in fact, it causes things to go underground. What I think needs to happen is education. You need to begin to have discussions, as you just said, and begin to educate people about what that little scene, that, that little scenario, what does that show us about um, the things that are going on in our matrix of society? Boy, I think that's brilliant. I think that would be, I think that would be so helpful. I don't know, I don't, I don't see how they're done. You know, you have three questions that are just really poignant, and, and I'm sure you have a, a dozen more that I think would be so so helpful for people because there are people in my place in life that just don't understand. You know, we are limited by, uh, you know, the whole nature-nurture thing. You know, we're, we're, we're limited by nature, but even more 
by nurture, by a history of experience. That our, our history of experience tells us what life is like. And if we aren't in the shoes of someone else, we can't know their experience. And we've got to investigate that and and try to do that. You know, and my my hope was that we could do it without vitriol. But I, mm-hmm. you know, I don't. Um, I mean, uh, you know, even apart from the 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 race and gender issue, you know, you have the entire left agenda versus. I don't know if there's a right agenda or not. I, I don't mean correct, but a right wing agenda. Um, but but it, it, it's just boiled down to name calling and insulting and denial. You know, there is no. There's no talk about it. There's no. Let's get in the chambers and work it over. It's it's very frustrating. It's a it's a it's a it's a it's a very troubling time for all of us. Yeah, and that is why fear is up, and bias is up. All the social scientists and psychologists are writing about that because as the the confusion goes up and the fear goes up, the bias, the the hidden bias goes up. It's not the things that we think we think that are affecting us. It's those questions that I pose to you about advantage and um, such that really get to the heart of those hidden assumptions and those hidden thoughts that are actually running the show. I know I know. there's so many times, Charlie, where I've been having a conversation with someone that's just humming along, for example, on an airplane. And then in the middle, I never will forget this. I was sitting in first class, was going, I think I was going to New York, and talking to this lady, an accountant, we're having a great conversation. And then somewhere about two hours into the ride, she asks me about my background. And when I told her that I was a black American, she gri- gripped on to the handle where you <laughs> call for the help. <laughs> You know, where you call for the, the flight attendant and said, no. Um, and suddenly everything changed because she had a whole bag of uh, assumptions that maybe she didn't even know she had. And she began to argue with me, Charlie, as if I don't know my own racial background. <laughs> you can't be. Well, you no. can't be. You but don't. How, how is that? Well, you can't. It's not. It's not possible. No. And you know, she began to kind of lean away and back up. And um, oh, this, Dina. I, so, so what did that do? That's right. What did that do to you? Well, Charlie, that has happened so many times. If I had a quarter for every time it happened, I would be as rich as Midas. Because, and this is my point. This was a, you know, a lady who saw herself as a, a, you know, a nice, good, intelligent, educated lady. And she was all of those things. In addition to that, she also held what seemed to be some, some assumptions, and we call them hidden bias, implicit bias, unconscious. They're all the same. Or racism. You know, they're all, it's all the same. And it was, it was, I did not fit her picture. So when this happens, I've had people get so angry that they yell at me. I've had people run away. And because it so shocks <laughs> their picture. They, they can't, they cannot bring cohesion to this thing matching this thing. Obviously, this doesn't happen with everybody. Some people go, oh, really? Okay. And then we continue the conversation. But there have been many times where it doesn't happen that way. And we are not, again, we're not taught to lean into that space of discovery. Without shame, without just say, wow, okay, tell me more about that. I would not have known that. Tell me more about that. So, Dina, you know what I'm curious about, and and I'm going to probe even deeper. You know, if you had a quarter for every time that happened to you, when, when did you hit the point where you can focus on love, you can focus on dialogue, discussion, understanding, empathy? Where did you, how did you get to that point instead of 
the most common thing would be of anger and defensiveness. And, you know, my guess is you probably went through that stage in your life. I I don't know, but it, it would seem natural. But how did you get to this point of understanding of saying, we need to work together. This is a together thing. This is not a me thing. This is my, not a my group thing or a your group thing. This is a human thing, and we need to get to work together as humans. Where, how, how did you get to that point, Dina? I really have to credit my grandparents and my great-grandmother and You know, I just really, my uncle, I really have to credit my family because I was never, I was never told or taught to have an expectation that people were going to see me as I am. And I was also taught to know that there are many people who will look at me and misunderstand who I am. Now, this isn't to say that that's the right thing. It isn't to say that people um, shouldn't maybe do a little better or or have a more expansive view. That's not what that's saying, and I think a lot of people who are very active or activists now, they misunderstand that. We're not saying that it's right the way they, things are, but you do have to understand the way things are. And if you go in expecting things to be different than they are, this is something Machiavelli even talks about, you will just always wind up hurt and disappointed. So I think that's the first thing, that I, I, I don't have this expectation of entitlement. Even though I know it, it, it would be morally correct, I know that's not what the world we live in. And then the second thing is also from my family, and it's love. It is this advantage that they gave me of knowing without a doubt that despite what the world thinks of me, despite what these other people think of me and how somebody else might devalue me, what they're doing is really none of my business in the sense that it's not the final word. They're not the authority. And... You know, I, I operate in the world that, through the, it, through the world, from that point of view. So when I was like three years old, for example, my grandfather, he created a book. And he, he had inscribed and embossed on the cover of this book, The Genius and the Love of Miss Dina Crowder. And every time I would do something, appear in the newspaper or do something good, he would take a picture, he would write about it, he would put it in this book. And that's just one of the many things that my grandparents and great-grandparents did to demonstrate to me that I am worthy, that I am valuable, that I am loved, and that I am powerful, and that somebody else's negative opinion does not determine my value. You know, Dina, you were... um uh, I, I wish I wish your your family raised most of us because uh, that's a that's a that's a great testament to to I, I think it's a testament to all of us whether we're in power or not in power that we're not that we are not entitled and that we have certain responsibilities and that we when we are disparaged by people we see what we can learn from it and we dismiss the rest. And we move on from a state of, of love and value and respect. And I, I think, you know, that can be so missing in all cultures, you know, that, that parents are not... We, you, last week, Terry Hershey and I talked about character, and, um, and, and y- y- you know, we talked about it. It is... It's 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 something that's learned and it's something that you develop. I mean, you 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 can work on developing it, but but if it's not inbred early, it's very difficult to apprehend later. Mhm, mhm. Yeah, if you if you weren't, and it's not told that you are loved, but if you didn't feel someone cared about you, someone loved you. And this isn't just my opinion as someone who 
mentors and coaches people with a spiritual basis. The head of the Institute for Childhood Trauma, he 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 Oprah did a story on him and he explained to Oprah the question that we usually ask is what's wrong with that person and the question we should be asking is what happened to that person because when there's trauma when something occurs it's a what happened that has caused them to then make these choices that bring them to this spot wherever you know wherever we see them where we say god what's their life is screwed up or you know they're they're in a victim consciousness or whatever the the issue is so it's what happened to them and always it can be traced back to if this person is going to be able to become more whole and succeed there's someone a coach a teacher a grandparent a parent somebody who says, I care about you, you matter, and you're loved, and that they feel that, that it is valid. And it, Oprah, when she did this story on this man who runs the Trauma Institute, she said it all clicked for her because she had a teacher. And she credits this teacher with being that force that contradicted the trauma so the disadvantage, let's say, that she was experiencing um, in the position at the time, she was molested and, you know, just all kinds of things happened to her. And yet she had this teacher that said, you can do it. I believe in you and really encouraged her with her reading and her studies. And that made the difference. So always it's even if you just have one person, Charlie, who steps in and plays that role for you, that can shift all of it. Boy, I think that's a message for all of us, is not as much seeking that one person, but being that one person. Absolutely. Can we be, can we be that person? And I, I, I'll, I'll wrap it up with my own story, and that, as you all know, you know, I was, I was adopted, and I had a, you know, pretty traumatic childhood until I was almost eight years old. And I was adopted by a goddess. Um, I was adopted by an aunt and uncle, but my aunt, you know, was a matriarchal family. And my aunt took me from a discarded child to a most loved child, a most loved, honored, respected, you are capable, don't worry about your grades right now, they're not, they're you, you know, that's not important. Just just keep working hard. Keep doing what you're doing. We love you. We support you. But you know, at the same time, it wasn't this vacuous love. She had boundaries, and that's what I had never really had before. But she had boundaries to live in, and she loved me to no end. But she said, if I cross, if, if I cross those boundaries, be prepared to die. But, un- <laughs> but, but understand... I'm going to love you while I'm killing you. <laughs> you know, mm-hmm. it was it was just this wonderful and and if we had more people like that. And so I would like to encourage our listeners that that take your children or take somebody else's children, be a big brother, big sister or just or just a, a neighborhood kid if you're a coach, you know, I mean, I'm I'm thinking of my times as a coach and the influence I had on these 8 to 12 year old kids. I mean, it was just I was, you know, I probably ran their life as much as their parents, and mm-hmm. I never realized it at that time. Fortunately, I was a, you know, I was, I was, I was the same kind of guy, you know. I, uh, you know, cross the lines and you die, but you know, as I'm killing you, I'm going to love you to death. You know, you get on the cheek, you'll get a kiss on the cheek as you get a pound in the butt. You know, um, but, but, I would, I would encourage everybody to seek to be that kind of person in someone else's life. And Dina, I think you were a role model. You um, you have impacted my life in the last two to three years as much as anybody has ever impacted my life with your wisdom, your kindness, your love, and and your gentle, harsh corrections. <laughs> Maybe not harsh, gentle, but direct corrections, mm-hmm. but you're always so gentle about it, and um, you are, 
you are the perfect mentor. You're you're really you're you're really someone I do appreciate. Thank you, Charlie. I I appreciate you so much, and I love your your words, encouraging your listeners to be that point of love for someone else. And I'm going to ask them to stretch and invite them to stretch into being that love for somebody who normally or a type of person they normally have some assumptions about, maybe even a little bit negative assumptions about. So maybe that's women in the workplace. Maybe that's black people. Maybe that's brown people. Maybe that's Spanish-speaking people. I don't know. Whatever it is, everybody's different. But to invite you to meet somebody at that point of humanity that you normally would devalue, normally would dismiss, normally not maybe interact human to human with, and then be that point of love for that person. Ask them, how are you doing? How's your life? How can I help you? Great ideas, Dina. Dina Crowder, thank you so much for spending time with me today. You are absolutely the best. Uh, You're the best. Thank you. It's always my pleasure. And I want to thank um, all our listeners for tuning in to the next chapter with Charlie. And be sure to check us out at our website, thenextchapter.life. And until next, this is Charlie Hedges signing off. Bye for now.